Our sermon title this morning is God's Unfailing Comfort. God's Unfailing Comfort. We're in part two as we've been working through this text uh, last week and now this week, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Now this morning, as we further unpack our text, uh, I think it's really important that we spend some time again uh, to set the table. Uh, really important with respect to Christian suffering to provide context for this passage. As I was preparing this week and studying this week, uh, just more impressed with the importance of understanding this particular subject and how this applies to the Christian life. We'll have many opportunities to do this as we work through 2 Corinthians, but again, in light of Paul's statements here, in light of this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 through 7, and then next sermon, maybe the next one after that, as we get into the next text, I want us to understand what is on Paul's heart and mind as he addresses the issue of suffering and comfort with the Corinthians. And he's doing that for us. Uh, He is writing as much to the Corinthians as he is to us uh, by the Spirit of God for our benefit. So let's set the table. Let's provide some context this morning. Christian suffering or suffering for Christ, the sufferings of Christ, is an important theme in this letter. And a better understanding of Christian suffering is going to serve us well as we work through the letter. So as we set the table, as we provide the context, turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. And look there beginning at verse 19. Acts chapter 14, verse 19. Now as Paul is preaching the gospel through Galatia on his first missionary journey, he and Barnabas face severe persecution. Severe persecution. Paul, Barnabas, the other disciples, suffered for preaching the gospel. If you look at verse 19, we pick up the narrative here. They're preaching the gospel through Galatia, and they reach Lystra. In verse 19, Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. They followed Paul and Barnabas to Lystra. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. He's at the end of his trip in Acts 14. He's preaching in Lystra. In anger, in hostility against the preaching of the gospel, the multitude rises up against Paul and Barnabas, and they stone Paul. Believing him to be dead, they drag his body out of the city. They likely throw it on the city trash heap. And look at verse 20. However, when the disciples then gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. He goes right back into Lystra. And the next day, he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Now remember, Paul is battered. Paul is bruised. He's likely bleeding. He was just rendered unconscious by rocks to the head. And he is thought to be, was thought to be dead. And in verse 21, he arrives in Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and to Antioch. Paul's suffering didn't deter him from fulfilling his calling. Paul's suffering, the persecution, didn't deter Paul from doing that which God had called him to do, preaching the gospel. It's tremendous, right? If you consider that, Such tremendous adversity, such tremendous difficulty, and Paul is undaunted in the task that he's been called to. He goes right back into Lystra. The next day, he's in Derby preaching the gospel. God works mightily through the preaching of the gospel. Many disciples in that city are made, and then they head to Lystra again, returning to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. Now, in verse 22, Paul gives two reasons for going back to the very cities where he was so savagely persecuted for preaching the gospel. Those two reasons in verse 22 are these. One, to strengthen the souls of the disciples. And two, to exhort them to continue in the faith. Then Paul tells us why he was compelled to go back. Listen, many of us, right? Right? 
if you get stoned and dropped on a trash heap in this city, probably not going back there again, right? Paul, undaunted, goes back to Lystra. He goes back to the place where these Jews came from. He goes back to Iconium, right? Goes back to Antioch for the purpose of strengthening the disciples and then exhorting them to continue in the faith. He's so concerned about those new brothers and sisters in those places. Why? Why? Why does he want to strengthen them? Why does he exhort them? Why does he want to exhort them to continue in the faith? Verse 22, we must, because, brothers and sisters, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And Paul's heart and mind, Paul knew. Paul had counted the cost. Paul had experienced the cost. And Paul was willing to pay the cost. And he knew those young, fledgling, new disciples in Lystra, in Derby, in Iconium, in Antioch, they needed to be strengthened. They needed to be prepared. They needed to understand in their hearts and minds, listen, it is with much tribulation. It is through much adversity, much difficulty that we're going to enter the kingdom of God. We live in a time of tribulation. It may be unbeknownst to some of us living in this country at this time, but the church age is a period of great tribulation. The church age is a period of adversity, of difficulty. Paul told Timothy in Ephesus, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, Paul said, you've carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. You followed my persecutions, my afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. He's talking about these persecutions right here that he suffered in Acts 14. He said, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, Paul says, the Lord delivered me. That's an astounding statement in and of itself. Paul credits, blesses God for having delivered him out of persecutions when Paul was stoned at Lystra and dropped on a trash heap. How did the Lord, he preserved his life preserved him in ministry for their benefit. Paul's got a gospel kingdom oriented focus on his mission, on his task. But then Paul adds this to Timothy. He says in verse 12, yes, and all, not just me, Paul says. It's not just that I'm going to face these persecutions. Paul says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's why Paul goes back. That's why Paul goes back. He wants to strengthen the souls of the disciples. He wants to exhort them to continue in the faith. Why? Because everyone who desires to live for Christ... Everyone who desires to be godly will suffer persecution. Paul told the Christians in Philippi, he says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also it has been granted to you to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. It has been granted. Listen to the language that Paul uses, right? Paul told the Christians in Thessalonica. He said, I sent Timothy to you to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation. By way of application, Paul tells the Christians at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Orlando, tribulation, persecution, suffering is a given if you follow Christ. It's a promise. It's a guarantee in the Christian life. Let me make clear that modifying clause. If you follow Christ... To you it has been appointed. It's been appointed for you and I to suffer because of your identification with Christ. To you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now there are many, there are many, right, who shrink back from following Christ. Christ. 
when they should be preaching the gospel, they shrink back from preaching the gospel. Someone who shrinks back from preaching the gospel is not going to suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel. To that one who desires to be godly in Christ Jesus, that one will suffer persecution. There are many who, because of a fear of man, refuse to follow Christ in preaching the gospel, preaching the kingdom. They refuse to take a stand for righteousness. They compromise with this world. They compromise with their worldly boss. They compromise with their finances. Or they comp- compromise in any number of ways. That cowardly compromiser will not suffer persecution because of a stand for righteousness because they're not taking a stand for righteousness. Do you see? But all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's a guarantee. It's a given. It's a promise. Paul refers to the nature of this suffering back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 5, these sufferings which the godly faithful in Christ will suffer, these sufferings are referred to by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5, as the sufferings of Christ. Look at verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, Christian may suffer with health problems. And the God of all comfort is there to comfort us in all of our tribulation. There's comfort from God in times of health difficulty in there. The false health, wealth, prosperity gospel be damned, but a Christian may suffer under poverty, right? And the God of all comfort will come alongside and teach us how to be abased, The world is full of suffering as a result of the fall. This world is ravaged by suffering, heartbreaking devastation as the consequence of sin. But God is near to the Christian in all of that. God condescends to comfort his own through all of it. And we cast all our cares on him because we know that he cares for us. And a Christian really, a Christian can't comprehend going through real hardship without him. Amen? I don't know how the world does it. However, with his reference to the sufferings of Christ in verse 5, Paul has in mind, we need to have in mind, that tribulation that we face due to our association with him. The suffering that we endure in identification with him. Now you may say, right, man, I'm suffering, I'm so busy. It's not what Paul has in mind here. And it's not the suffering that we've been called to. Uh, I'm having trouble with my boss. Is it because of righteousness for Christ's sake? No, it's just he's a jerk. Well, that's not, listen, we're not talking about that kind of suffering. I've got a hangnail. It's really been bothering me. We're not talking about that kind of suffering. We're talking about the suffering that we face in our association with him, our identification with it. Suffering for preaching the gospel. Suffering for taking a stand for righteousness. Suffering for an uncompromised obedience to the word of God. It's suffering that can be physical. That kind of suffering can be mental. That suffering can be emotional. That suffering can be spiritual. A combination of all of those. But Christians for 2,000 years have been hated, robbed, arrested, imprisoned, beaten, tortured, and killed for their witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are blessed by God that the sufferings of Christ in our context today seldom go beyond mocking, scorn, derision, threats, right? And I'm no prophet, But that's not going to last too much longer. That's not going to last too much longer. We're going to face suffering. And we know that that's going to be the case. We're not surprised as a church, right? Through our experiences here, if you've been with us any length of time, we're not surprised that life in the Lord's church is hard. We don't think it's strange that we face persecution, that we face adversity or difficulty. We know that it's coming. We don't think it's strange that this lost world hates the gospel, hates Christ, and persecutes God's people when they preach it. Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. And he says to his disciples, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, Jesus says, they will also persecute you. So what's the point of all this suffering? 
What's the point? I think it's helpful as we get a backdrop for our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It's helpful to think about Christian suffering in its redemptive historical context, right? Helpful to get an understanding of this, of what's going on with the big picture. And I want to do that from Colossians chapter 1. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And look with me beginning at verse 24. How does all this suffering, the suffering that we've been called to, the suffering that has been appointed for us, the suffering that we will certainly face when we step out in bold faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what's the context of all that suffering? What does it mean? What does it point to? If you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, Paul says this, I now rejoice in my sufferings. It's the Greek word there for sufferings is pathema. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions, that's the word thlepsis, the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. The same Greek words used for suffering and tribulation or affliction here in Colossians chapter 1 are the same words used in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 through 7, the text that we're studying, okay? Same Greek words. Now verse 25, speaking of the church, Paul says, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. He's speaking there of the gospel, the word of God, the gospel, which is the gospel, verse 26, which is the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Now note how Paul begins verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. He has suffered for the cause of Christ. We see one example of that in Acts 14, right? He suffered for preaching the gospel. Paul says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He bears in himself the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ for the Corinthians, right? He suffered for the good of the church. He suffered for the glory of God. In all of that, Paul could rejoice. Paul rejoiced that he was counted worthy to suffer for Christ. It was a badge of honor to Paul. Now, why is it that Paul could rejoice? It's because Paul had a right understanding, a right context for Christian suffering. And we're going to work on building a little bit of that this morning. Now, he says something very interesting at the end of verse 24. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul essentially says in verse 24, there at the end, I am filling up in my flesh. In other words, in my own suffering, I am doing my part to complete what is lacking in regard to Christ's sufferings. Let me explain, okay? Paul is not saying that there is anything lacking in Christ's all-sufficient sacrifice. There's nothing that lacks in Christ's redemptive work. Nothing that lacks in Christ's atoning work. His atoning suffering is complete and it is perfect, okay? However, as one commentator stated it, for the glory of God, there is something lacking in regard to the tribulations that pertain to Christ the Messiah as he is proclaimed in the world. There's something lacking. And Paul is saying here, in my own suffering, I'm filling up in my flesh, in my own suffering, I am doing my part to complete what is lacking in those tribulations, what is lacking in regard to Christ's suffering. Jewish literature referred to these tribulations as messianic woes. Messianic woes. These Messianic woes are what Paul refers to as the sufferings of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. Here in Colossians 1.24, these messianic woes are what Paul refers to here as the afflictions of Christ. Right? He's using similar language, the same words, right? Messianic woes refer to the tribulations, the the sufferings, the afflictions that God's people will endure as they preach the kingdom 
before the coming of the Messiah. In Jewish literature, and from the Bible, they proclaimed or taught that God's people before the coming of the Messiah would suffer eschatological or messianic woes. They would suffer tribulation. As they preached the kingdom, they would suffer these messianic woes. They would suffer tribulation, suffering, affliction. The New Testament refers to this time period as the last days. The last days. Paul says to Timothy, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And we know that we're living in the last days. These are, John says, little children, this is the last hour, right? Peter says, scoffers will come in these last days, walking according to their own lusts. Matthew describes the times in which we live as the beginning of sorrows. The last days began with the first coming of Christ. When Christ came, the last days began, the last days were inaugurated with the coming of his kingdom. And they will be fulfilled. They will be completed. They will be filled up when Christ comes back. All right? These are the last days. So what does this have to do? What does this have to do with what Paul says then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24? Look there. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. What is lacking then and what remains to be filled up are the sufferings, are the tribulations, are the, the messianic woes that Christ's own body, his people, the church, must endure as co-heirs with him. As his kingdom is pressed into this world, his people, his body, suffer the messianic woes, the tribulations, the sufferings of Christ, the afflictions that remain of a sovereignly determined tribulation that we participate in that will be filled up or completed at the second coming of Christ. We've been appointed to this. We've been appointed to that suffering. Peter says, for to this you have been called. To what? To suffer. To suffer. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Called to, to suffer for Christ. Why, Peter says there, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. This is what we've been called to. This is a period of time of tribulation, a period of time for God's people to enter into the sufferings of Christ and fill up what is lacking until Christ comes back and completes. You know, and the kingdom is pressed into this world. As the kingdom is preached, as the kingdom is pressed into this world, God's people will suffer. Everywhere, everywhere in Scripture, we're called to embrace this suffering we're called to understand it and embrace it. We're called to take joy in it. Matter of fact, we're, we're called to embrace this suffering with exceeding joy. Why? Because this is the spread of his kingdom and Christ is coming back. We're called to embrace this suffering with joy. Paul rejoiced in it. Paul rejoiced in it. James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Peter says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. If anyone suffers as a Christian, Peter says, let him glorify God. The Hebrew Christians in Hebrews chapter 10 joyfully accepted the plundering of their goods. The disciples rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, the churches of Macedonia, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, even in their deep poverty, abounded in their giving. Why? How is that? It's because Peter, James, Paul, the churches in Macedonia, the Hebrew Christians, understood the context and purpose and end result of Christian suffering. As we, as we face suffering, right, as we consider our trials, no matter how difficult, we are to embrace them, rejoicing with joy inexpressible and full of glory, right? Now, why would we do that? How do we do that? 
Why, how do we do that? Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We are filling up. We are completing that sovereignly determined tribulation. The sufferings of Christ. We're filling up with Paul what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. How do we do that? Why would we do that? 1 Peter chapter 3. Look beginning at, at chapter 3 and verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 13, and Peter writes, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed, all right? Embrace your suffering with joy because when you suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Do you see? Verse 14, do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Don't shrink back from preaching the gospel. Don't shrink back. Don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you, not if, right, but when they defame you as evildoers, when you are persecuted, when you suffer, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Why? Drop down to verse 18. Why? Because Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. We enter into the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ for us, that which he suffered for us. One way that I embrace my sufferings for Christ with joy is by meditating on the fact that he endured suffering for me with joy. The Lord Jesus Christ, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross for me, for you if you're in Christ. And he counted the shame of that thing a light matter, a light thing. Because Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Therefore, look down at 1 Peter chapter 4 then, chapter 4 verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, listen brother, listen sister, arm yourselves also with the same mind. As Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Embrace the sufferings of Christ. Christ was victorious in his suffering, triumph in your suffering, even if it means dying for him as he died for you. Amen? Why? Why? For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. The perfect tense of that verb there, has ceased, means that this is referring to the state of Christians as free from the guilt or the penalty of sin, right? They've been set free from the power of sin. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased, it's a perfect tense, ceased from sin. So why then are Christians set free from sin? Look at verse 2. Why are Christians set free from sin? So that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness and lusts and drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Drop down to verse 7. We've spent enough time doing that Verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. These are the last days. Now, how are we to live in these last days as members of Christ's body, his church? How are we to live? Verse 7, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. You list other things there and then drop down to verse 12. This is how we live in the last days, this period of tribulation. He says, beloved, verse 12, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But what does he command us to do? Rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of the messianic woes. You partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. 
Listen, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, comes back on the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. And when you, brother, when you, sister, suffer for Christ in this life, when you partake of Christ's sufferings, when he comes back, you will be overwhelmed with exceeding joy because when he comes back in his glory, you are glorified with him. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, behold, Jesus says, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, right? He's coming with your reward, my reward, if you partake of the sufferings of Christ in this life, you'll be glorified with him when he comes. You'll be glad with exceeding joy. Embrace the sufferings of this life. Don't shrink back from them. Don't fear. Embrace them with exceeding joy, knowing that your reward is with him. Your reward is with him. Incidentally, incidentally, when, when Jesus comes back, Christians hated by this world having endured suffering for him, are vindicated. They, because of their faith in Christ, are seen as approved by God. Their tested faith, their proven faith, which is much more precious than gold, which perishes, right? That tested, proven faith is approved by God. Their patient endurance by faith, right? Being moved with a godly fear, like Hebrews 11 speaks of Noah. Their patient endurance by faith, moved with a godly fear, condemns this world. And when Christ returns, he comes to reward the wicked according to their works as well. Christ comes back with a reward in his hand for the wicked also. And he will recompense them for their deeds. Revelation 22 goes on to say that cast out then, cast out are dogs. That's a descriptive word for a wicked, rebellious, lost person, a dog. Cast out are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. If you've never turned from your sin to put your faith and trust in Christ, to entrust yourself to him, to commit yourself to him. If you've never turned from your sin, your life of wickedness, your life of rebellion, if you've never turned from that to follow Christ, heart, soul, mind, and strength, then you are a dog. You're a sorcerer. You're a sexually immoral person, a murderer, an idolater, someone who loves and practices a lie. And Jesus Christ is coming back with a reward in his hand to recompense you according to your deeds. So his return should be terrifying to you. Turn from your sin. The Lord is gracious. He is merciful, abounding in grace, and he relents from doing harm. Turn from your sin and trust Christ. Christ comes back with a reward for his own, and they will be glad with exceeding joy. And if you continue to rebel against him and reject him in this life, you will be tormented in bitterness and in hatred against him for all eternity. He goes on to say in verse 14, this is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. If you're reproached, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. We embrace our suffering with joy because through patient, faithful endurance in trials, God the God who made us, the God who bought us, God is glorified. But Peter says, verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, verse 16, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. 
For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of, house of God. And if it begins with us first, if it's difficult, if it's painful, if it's hard for a Christian to enter the narrow gate, to get into heaven, so to speak, right? What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Think about it this way. Just as it was necessary for Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory, it is necessary For the Lord's people, his body, the church, it is necessary for his people to suffer these messianic woes in identification with him in order to enter into our glory. Do you see? We are identified with him. It's an awesome thought, though, in all this to understand and to know that he also identifies us, identifies with us in our suffering. Hebrews chapter 2, and we won't turn there for the sake of time, Hebrews chapter 2 Said it says that it's fitting that the captain of our salvation should be made perfect through sufferings, right? And that he who is sanctified or set apart and those who are being sanctified and being set apart are one and that the Lord Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call us brothers. He identifies with us when we suffer for him. Referring to the glory that will be ours in eternity, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. He says, for our, our light affliction, that's what he calls suffering in this life. Our suffering, the sufferings of Christ in this life. Paul, who was stoned and left for dead, is saying this. Our light affliction, Paul says, which is but for a moment, here one second and gone the next. Paul says that suffering is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Our suffering in this life is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Embrace your suffering, brother. Embrace your suffering, sister. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by embrace that? Obey God and take what comes. Obey the Lord. Trust Him. And then when the suffering comes... Endure that with patience, with perseverance, with love for Christ. Obey him. Obey him. When he says preach the gospel, preach the gospel. Don't let fear or intimidation or threats, don't fear their faces. Don't shrink back. Aside from that glory, the glory that is ours when he returns, of ultimate importance to remember is that God is glorified. God is seen as glorious when his people faithfully persevere through suffering by faith in him. So let's summarize this. Let's put this together, okay? Let's put this together. One, Christians will suffer for the cause of Christ. Christians will suffer for the cause of Christ. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Two, Christians are appointed to suffer for the cause of Christ. It is to this in these last days that we are called, Paul says, Peter says, Jesus says. Three, Christians, when they suffer, partake of the sufferings of Christ or messianic woes. We we fill up or complete what remains of divinely sanctioned affliction, divinely appointed affliction. Four, Christians suffer for the glory of God and for the joy that is set before them, just as our Lord suffered for the joy that was set before him. We do that following his example. Five, 
Christians, therefore, embrace their suffering, looking to the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation. You have a busy schedule? Obey the Lord, and the God of all comfort will comfort you in your tribulation, in your trial, which is a momentary light affliction. When you fear walking up to a door or walking up to a stranger, obey the Lord in preaching the gospel. And the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies, will comfort you in all your tribulation as you press forward in his kingdom cause for his glory. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that's the introduction. <laughs> All of this, right, this is Paul's understanding, his thinking, uh, what's in his heart and mind. This is Paul's understanding of Christian suffering, of Christian suffering. That's the context, right? This is the backdrop for our text. We are enduring the sufferings of Christ, messianic woes for the glory of God. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that Paul doesn't begin 2 Corinthians by focusing on or by emphasizing the suffering. That's a given. And he's told the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, he told them, we are the off-scouring of the world. Right? He's told them of these sufferings already. Paul doesn't begin by focusing on the suffering. Paul erupts in praise to God for all that comfort that God provides in our suffering. There's so many reasons, so many benefits, so many blessings that are associated with Christian suffering. It's, it's outside the scope of a sermon like this to, to detail those. It, it would be a 50-sermon series uh, to do something, if not more, to do something like that, right? There's so many blessings afforded the believer when they suffer for Christ, so many comforts given by God. We've addressed just a few here, the joy right, that God affords us, the comfort that God's, uh, God affords us when we have an, uh, a right end times perspective on our suffering. But here, he erupts in praise to God for all that comfort that God provides. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Right? Praise God for his unfailing comfort. If you're a Christian and you're suffering, you will be comforted by the comfort with which God comforts his own people in their suffering. It's a glorious promise. We can rejoice in all our sufferings because we partake of the sufferings of Christ and because God comforts us in all our tribulation, right? God is good. God is kind. God is compassionate. He knows what we need and he meets that need. And we're faithful to obey him, faithful to follow him. Right? There's so many blessings, so many benefits. But remember this from last week now as we work through the text. Last week, we considered God's provision of that comfort in verse 4. He comforts us in all our tribulation. Next, we considered one of God's purposes for that comfort in verse 4. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And then lastly, we considered God's promise of comfort in verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ, the afflictions of Christ, those messianic woes, as the sufferings of Christ abound toward us, so also our consolation abounds through Christ. Our comfort abounds through him. So if you're suffering, brother, sister, if your suffering seems to be abounding, then rest assured God's comfort through Christ abounds as sufficient to meet the challenge, to meet the need. He's going to see you through. So commit yourself to him in doing good, right? He will meet the need. Commit your soul to him in doing good. Now, having praised God for these precious truths in verses 3, 4, and 5, his unfailing comfort, Paul then turns his attention to their practical application to the Corinthians in verses 6 and 7. He's going to apply that reality in his context in the Corinthian church. And he says this in verse 6. Now, Paul says, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. 
or, Paul says, if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. Therefore, point two on your notes in the bulletin there, trust God for his unfailing comfort. Trust God. Now consider with me, from verses six and seven, consider with me two reasons why we should trust God for his unfailing comfort. One, Paul says of God's comfort in verse six that it is effective. It is effective. Paul says that if we are afflicted, or if we are comforted, God uses both as a means to your comfort and salvation. And that means, Paul says, is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. God's appointed means is effective. We should trust him for his unfailing comfort. Secondly, Paul says of God's comfort in verse 7 that it is enduring. That it is enduring. It's effective in verse 6. It's enduring in verse 7. In fact, our hope for you, Paul says, endures. It's steadfast because God's faithful comfort endures. As you partake of suffering throughout your Christian life, so also along the way, you will surely partake of his enduring and persevering and unfailing comfort. God's comfort is effective, verse 6. God's comfort is enduring, verse 7. Trust God for his unfailing comfort. Do you see? Now, before we begin to unpack those two points, we'll begin here and then finish next week, I want us to note an important observation with respect to the practical application of this passage. Both the, the suffering and the comfort of God's people takes place within the context of the church. Paul is addressing here a community of believers. He's addressing the Corinthian church. And through his letter, he's addressing us in community. He's addressing our church here, right? Now notice the purpose statement that he gives in verse 4. The purpose statement we see in verse 4. God comforts us in all our tribulation for the purpose that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now the, the implications of that truth, that purpose in verse 4, are then drawn out and applied to the Corinthians by Paul in verse 6. Paul says in verse 6, now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. It's for your comfort, which is, in, is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, Paul says, it's for your consolation and salvation. Notice the contrast. Whether Paul is afflicted or whether Paul is comforted, it's for your comfort. Paul is applying that truth to the Corinthian church. The word order in the New King James is somewhat confusing. Much better in the ESV. The ESV also takes into consideration an important variant that's there in the text that is well supported. And here's what you get. Verse 6. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort or salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. See the difference there? This makes more sense. We see one purpose for our suffering in verse 4, that purpose being that we may comfort others. Paul picks up on that and applies it in verse 6. When we suffer, Paul says, when we are comforted, it's for you. Do you see? Paul applies the truth of that purpose in verse 4. He applies it in the context of the church. We apply it in our context. When I suffer, it should be for your benefit. It should be for your comfort. If I am comforted, it should be for your benefit, for your comfort. When you suffer through trial, when you are afflicted, when you have difficulty... It should be for your brother's comfort. When you learn the grace of God in the midst of your adversity and you patiently endure by the grace of God through faith, 
It should be for your sister's comfort, for your sister's edification. Consider a few points with me in reference to this church-wide understanding of suffering. One is this. Paul, in order for this to be the case, in order for that purpose to be fulfilled, Paul must himself endure the suffering well. In other words, if Paul's suffering, and he's like grumbling and complaining, I'm not going back to Lystra. If Paul's grumbling and whining and complaining, he's not enduring the suffering well, it doesn't have the effectiveness that God intends. Do you see? A faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ must maintain faith and faithfulness in the midst of difficulty. You can't throw in the towel. You can't give up. Patiently endure. Right? You can't retreat. I'm just going to take a year off from the church because I'm having it difficult at home. You must endure in faith and in faithfulness and endure the suffering well. Paul has has just exhorted the Corinthians to this kind of steadfastness in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Just look at the opposite page, right? Chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, Paul says, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable. When these sufferings, these afflictions come upon you, don't be tossed to and fro. Don't be wavering or unfaithful. Don't retreat or shrink back. Be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Listen, when you're facing difficult difficulty, that's not the time to stop attending church, to stop faithfulness to the Great Commission, to throw in the towel and start going back to your sin and wallowing in your sin. It's not the time to do it. It's the time to be abounding in the work of God, right? Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain in the Lord on the benefit of those to whom you're ministering, and it's not in vain in the Lord toward you. Abound in that work of the Lord. Your charge, your charge in suffering is to stand fast, is to stand fast, stand firm for Christ in the face of difficulty. When it gets hard, you cling to Christ. You cling, you abound in that good work. You give yourself entirely to the Lord's work, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of trial. Paul must himself endure the suffering well if that comfort that God intends is to be effective. Secondly, Paul must understand in all this his responsibility to the community. Paul has to understand his responsibility to the Lord's people, the Lord's church. Paul can't circle the wagons when the going gets tough and isolate himself, right? Paul is to esteem others more highly than himself in this. Look with me at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Paul understands that when he suffers, when he's afflicted, when he goes through difficulty, that the comfort with which he is comforted is to be for the benefit of God's people, is to be for their benefit, for their comfort, for their edification. Philippians chapter 1, and look at verse 27, okay? Verse 27, only let your conduct, the Philippians here, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. Now listen, You're going through a tough time. You're having difficulty. Would you be able to say that with the brothers and sisters here, that you have remained steadfast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together with us for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by the affliction or the adversaries that have come upon you? Does that describe your experience of difficulty or suffering here? Many times, many times, right? And listen, we're weak. We have need of grace. So there are times when in difficulty you falter or you fail or you retreat. 
You're not striving together with us with one mind, one spirit, one faith, one baptism. You're not striving together with us. You're sort of for a period of time a wart on the body, not really doing a lot around here. But listen, when you acknowledge, when you recognize that, acknowledge it, repent of that, and do what Paul is saying here. These Philippians are to stand fast. They are standing fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's what church, that's what community is all about. We are here as members of this church, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And listen, we invite you to strive alongside us. We want to strive together. But some of you stop striving Stand fast, brother. Stand fast, sister. Strive with us. And when, listen, when I stop striving, you come alongside me and you say the same thing. Listen, you better stand fast, brother. Say the same thing to me. We are to stand fast together here. Drop down to verse 2. Our chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love... If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Don't just be a participant around here, a, a spectator, right? But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests. Listen, I've got my own stuff to take care of. I got, my, I got kids at home. I got stuff to do. I got a job. Right? I, I, listen, that's not the mentality that a Christian is to have. That's not the heart or the mind that you should have here. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a slave and coming in the likeness of men. Follow Christ as your example. Let the mind of Christ be in you. Have the same mind. Drop down to verse 12. Therefore, my beloved... As you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. For it's God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all these things without complaining, without disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you are to shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, Paul says, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Paul understood the context of his suffering. He was being poured out as a drink offering for them. You're to be poured out. You're to be poured out. You have a, a, a community here, a church here, a people here, brothers and sisters, that you are to love. Love your brother. Love your sister. Pour yourself out as a drink offering for them. Pour yourself into them. Pour yourself into this church. Pour yourself into the service of God. Serve Christ. It is for their benefit. But listen, it's also for your benefit, right? So many benefits afforded the believer by the grace of God when they suffer, so to speak, like this. Pour yourself out. Paul must endure suffering well. Paul must understand his responsibility to the community. Thirdly, Paul must accept the responsibility that he has been given for them. He is to labor in the body and to labor for the body. Look quickly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look there at verse 1. A couple of pages of the right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain. Even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold. We didn't shrink back. We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. <laughs> 
For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time do we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as, nursing, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So now Paul loves these people, right? Paul loves these people. So affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. You remember, brethren, don't you, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Drop down to verse 17. But we, brethren, have been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? You are our glory and joy. Right, Paul accepted his responsibility to the church. How are we to practically do that in our church? Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, we're to follow his example. Philippians chapter 4, we're to follow his example. How do we practically do that in our church? Number one, you must endure suffering well. <laughs> do you see? In faithfulness, giving glory to God. Don't shrink back. Press forward. Obey the Lord. Labor in faithfulness, abounding in the work of the Lord. Steadfast, immovable. You must endure suffering well. Secondly, you must understand your responsibility to the community. See where I'm going with this? Exactly as Paul did. You are to do. I am to do. You must endure your, you understand your responsibility to the church. You must be here. Involved, woven into the fabric. Listen, showing up on Sunday morning, taking up airspace for an hour, does not weave you into the life and the health of a church. You have a responsibility to do that. To Weave yourself in to press in, involved in the life of the church, with the brothers, among the brothers, fellowship, to be actively engaged in fellowship. There's, listen, there's, there's, a, there's a special fellowship. And listen, many of you, we've gone through tremendous adversity together, right? Have we not? And there's something about fellowship that is forged in the fire of suffering, of adversity, right? It's brothers in arms, linked arms together. When we go through that stuff together, right? It just knits us together. There's something about Christian fellowship that is forged in the fire, the crucible of adversity. Fellowship, small group. Listen, small group is the way that we shepherd. It's the way here that you love and serve. Don't fool yourself. If you're not here, woven into the fabric, the life and health of this church, you're sinning against God, you're sinning against your brother, and it's not doing you any good. Be involved in the church. So important. It's so important, in fact, that you signed a covenant. So important, in fact, that we have covenanted together, the people who are members of this church, to serve the Lord and to serve you in this way. Some of you are not fulfilling that covenant. You need to love these brothers. You need to love these sisters. Or you need to go and play nominal Christian somewhere else. Thirdly, you must accept that responsibility. Accept that responsibility and labor in the body and for the body, right? Whether you are afflicted or whether you are comforted, it's for their good, for their comfort, for their edification, for their building up. Before 
before the Lord comes back, during this time, during this time, we have a responsibility to this church, to these people. I love this church. I love, we're so blessed by God. So blessed. We have a responsibility to that, a responsibility to one another. So as the Lord tarries, before he comes back, let us fill up what is lacking amongst one another and out on the street, at the campus, at the mall, at the parks, at the restaurant, at school, on the job, in your family, on the phone, through email, through messaging on Facebook or whatever you have. Let's fill up what is lacking, what remains, until the Lord Jesus Christ completes it at his return and establishes in consummation his kingdom. And all at that time is made right, right? All praise, honor, and glory to the one who purchased his church with his own blood. And may you and I be faithful to minister in it as he has called us to. Let's take a few minutes and consider the word of God to us in this. Ask for the Lord's help that we might be faithful to this and fulfill it. And then when you are done, you're dismissed. Let's pray together.